Good afternoon, Facebook family and friends. Pastor Craig Ponder coming to you again from New Salem Baptist Church for a midday moment on a Wednesday. Hope and pray that your week thus far has been productive and blessed and safe and successful and full of God's great blessings in your life. Hope your family's well and hope you're doing good today. It is a joy to be able to come to you in the middle of, of, of your day, whatever your day looks like. Uh, if you're home with the kiddos today, or if you're on the job and on a lunch break, or maybe you're watching it right before you go to bed on a Wednesday night, wherever you find us today, I hope and pray that you're blessed. Uh, found out last night, I've got some family over in North Carolina that watches pretty regularly. So uh, Uncle Roy, Aunt Ruby, if you're watching, uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, it means a lot to know that you guys are watching. So uh, again, we want to begin with a word of prayer, and then I want to sing for you. If not his exact favorite, one of my dad's favorite songs. We'll sing it. Let's pray together first. Heavenly Father, I praise you again for another day of life. Lord, I thank you, Father, for a quiet night of rest. And Lord, I, I don't take it for granted, Lord, another night goes by that the phone doesn't ring and you watched over my new Salem family again. And for that, I give you all glory. And God, I praise you for the privilege to be able to come and and lift your name uh, in song and in testimony and through your word, Lord, just to, to uh, bring glory to you and, and all that you do in our lives. We, we, we praise you for your blessings that come in so many ways, blessings of, of provision and protection. and You supply our every need, our everyday needs, and, and even our desires and our wants. And God, we thank you for that. Now, thank you for the internet. I don't know if I've ever said it just like that before, but I thank you, Lord, that just one lone preacher in Limestone, Tennessee, has the potential to literally reach the world. What a blessing that is to us in ministry. And I pray, Lord, whoever's hearing these words today would be encouraged, that your spirit would be able to find them right through the through the, uh, the internet, through, the, through the, the computer signals, and be an encouragement to them, that the song will bless them, that the word will encourage your hearts. And Lord, they will just uh, feel your spirit settling right into where they are, in the car or at uh, the house or wherever they may find themselves right at this particular moment in time. Lord, many needs are on my heart and mind today. Father, I do ask a blessing continually, Lord, on, on little Catherine Edwards. I pray God you bless her and her mom and dad and extended family. Lord, I pray a little blessing on Jace today. Lord, you know all that's going on with his surgery and, and the pain he's having in his muscles today. Would you bless him and his family, Lord, as they're rallying him there at the hospital down in Knoxville. God, would you keep him safe and, and heal him, bring a recovery to his little body, God, in a miraculous kind of way. And Lord, you know those other ones that, that we think about every day. God, I pray a blessing upon them. God, I pray for Charles Jones and Lord, for, uh, for Miss Rose and all that's going on in her family and Lord, that continue blessings on those right in our, our immediate church family, Lord, that are bearing up in the worries and concerns and problems of life. Help us to rest today in the glorious promise that you've shared with us through your word, Father, the promise of your presence, that in the midst of uncertain days, in the midst of, of questions and um, circumstances that make no sense, Lord, we, we rest comfortably in the fact that you're omnipresent, that you're always with us wherever we go. So forgive our sin today, cleanse my heart, cleanse the sin of my mind and my sin of my hands, Lord, that I be a vessel suitable for your glory and for your purposes today. Thank you again for this Wednesday midday moment. Use me for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. As I've said before, anybody that knows me at, at church, um, Every time we sing, seems like every week, I'll, I'll tell you that uh, a particular song is one of my favorites. <laughs> uh, and my list of favorites is, is a mile long, I guess. But I, die, I have heard Dad say before at various times that uh, this is one of his favorites. And I hope he'll bless you. If Dad, if you're listening, Mom, Dad, if you're listening today, I hope you love this song. I don't know. Day to day, I 
favorites yeah probably one of those 156 favorites that... <laughs> well I forgot to turn off Mariner so I'll, I'll answer it on my watch and hopefully nobody else will call again I apologize for that um, that loud ring that uh, again just forgot to mute my phone so that's one of those oversights on my part and I apologize I want you to bring your Bibles today and find the 139th Psalm, Psalm 139, uh, as we continue a, a new four-part series that we just started, well, I guess Monday with introduction, but the first part of it, I guess, officially was on Tuesday, Four Sure Anchors for the Storms of Life. Very, very quickly, uh, this, this series was um, uh, kind of found its origin in Acts 27. Uh, there's a story there about Paul and 276 other men that are uh, sailing across the eastern Mediterranean Sea en route to Rome uh, when a sea or a storm at sea overtakes them. Verse 18 and 19 of that chapter says those men do all they knew to do, uh, all that they had been taught to do as sailors. They, they relied on their instincts. 
They trimmed the sails. They throw over stuff overboard, trying to wait, uh, you know, lighten the ship. They worked hard and did all that they could do within their abilities to keep the, that ship afloat. Now I said that verse number twenty of Acts twenty-seven may be one of the saddest, but most power-packed verses in the entire Bible, because the Bible says that neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small storm was assailing us. From then on, all hope of being saved was gradually abandoned. I dare say that you've all been there. You've been in circumstances where you felt like that, that all hope of ever being saved was gradually abandoned. Well, they came to the end of their abilities. Verse 29 of that chapter says they, they had done all they knew to do. So this crew of, of, of salt-crusted sailors came to a point of desperation, and Luke writes, fearing that we might run aground somewhere on the rocks, they cast four anchors from the stern and wished for daybreak. A very uh, gloomy picture, a very uh, a picture without little, with very little hope. As they said, we've given up any hope of ever being saved, and you know, it gradually left us. So they threw four anchors out into the, into the dark, stormy sea, and hoped, wished for daybreak. And it's those four anchors in verse 29 that inspired this series of messages that I preached the first time, you know, sometime back at this at New Salem. My purpose today, uh, yesterday was the promises of God. I, I want to challenge you today to, to, to anchor your soul, to anchor your life with uh, anchor number two, which is the presence of God. My purpose today is to challenge your heart and your minds with this truth. Whatever you're facing, my friend, whatever you're facing in your life, you're not in this thing by yourself. When the storms of life hit us, when they, when they knock us from side to side, we can find safety, we can find security by tying our souls, securing our soul to the anchor of God's presence. Now, some of you are familiar with Pastor Tony Evans. Some of you might have read some of his books, and uh, we've used some of his, his literature, his curriculum, some of our Bible studies. But he says in one of his books, and I forget which one, I apologize, I can't remember which one, but he says in one of his writings that there are three attributes of God, three attributes of God that are always working in tandem, working together. He says that God knows what needs to be done. That's omniscience, the all-knowing power of God. He has the power to do it. That's the omnipotence. That's the all-powerful nature of God. And he always understands, he, he, he always, he, we always understand that wherever we need him to be, that's where he'll be. That is the omnipresence of God. That's the focus of our study on this Wednesday. The idea of God's presence. Now, there's been countless seasons of life where the question has been asked in varying words and various attitudes and tones, where is God? Or where was God when, when I was going through this? Or where is God in the midst of this trial? Every, every section of humanity has asked that at one time or another. There's the seeker that truly wants to know where is God. But there is the skeptic that wants to know where is God. Guilty sinners uh, have often cried that prayer for more than reason so they can run the other direction. The hurting person, a hurting mom, hurting dad, hurting grandma or grandpa have, who've felt abandoned at times in life, they've even asked that question, where, where is God when I need him the most? But the omnipresent nature of God is, is one of the most difficult doctrines of the Bible probably for us to understand, but simply because we have no frame of reference. We have nothing to compare it to. We, we can't in our finite mind think of anything that is omnipresent or present all, always, everywhere. So just a simple working definition, and again, this is a much deeper topic, but just for the sake of this study, a simple working definition of omnipresence is the fact that the Lord our God is everywhere at all times at once. He is everywhere present at all times. Now, probably the closest, the closest illustration that I could get to try to make that 
come alive in your mind is the, the very air that we breathe. Most of the time, we don't even think about it. We, we don't even think about breathing, that we just do because we depend on it for our very existence. And I, and I guess that's probably a, a, one of the more simpler uh, illustrations to try to define the, the omnipresence of God is like the air we breathe. His presence is all around us, and if it was to be somehow withdrawn, not one of us could survive even one moment. So I want to, our focal text today is in Psalm 139. Psalm 139 is, is, a, is a rich, deep, very uh, personal song from the heart of David that, that I think clearly and, and, and quite definitively establishes uh, both, does a great job of establishing the omniscience of God, the fact that he knows us, but also the omnipresence of God. And in verse number 7 of Psalm 139, David asks two questions, kind of forming this second anchor for our soul. David says, where can I go from your spirit? Where could I flee from your presence? Two rhetorical questions that emphatically declare that God's presence is everywhere. And as this chapter unfolds, you begin to get this vision of David sitting out in the field somewhere, sitting on a, on a rock on the side of the ocean. So, somewhere he's just having this, this reflective moment. And he looks back on his life and begins to pen these very moving verses. Um, and I think there's a connection that you and I can make to David. Like a whole lot of us, uh, at various points in the life of David, he wanted to run from God. There were times in his life he wanted to flee from the presence of God, but as he matured in life, he, he had come to understand that there was nowhere he could go to get away from the presence of God. He began to understand the truth that many of you need to embrace today, that since God is a spirit, he, he has the ability to pierce us to the very heart. He has the ability to penetrate us and know us better than we know ourselves, but it makes it impossible for us to get away from him. So in verse number 8 of this chapter, watch it. David begins to contemplate what would happen if I tried to go up to heaven or maybe if I was to try to go down to hell. David has this understanding, a God-given understanding, that God would be present in the most upward regions of the world to the very depths of the earth, as low as he could ever go. Uh, he, he says even, even if I go to the very height, to the very depth, David decides, well, I'll, I'll travel east to west then. I can't go far enough up or far enough down. What about if I go far enough east or far enough west? And he says in verse number 9 that I, I meet the dawn. I'm traveling with the sun to the far side of the sea. That's an interesting uh, illustration there because uh, Jewish people, for the most part, are not mariners and, and have little to do with, with the ocean, but they recognize that God was there. They recognize that even in the depths of the sea, God will be found there. And that David, David coins this beautiful phrase, the wings of the morning. It's this, this elegant metaphor that refers to those, those sunbeams that flash out of the sun in the early morning or, or break through a cloudy day. You, you've all seen where those beams of light just come uh, shooting out of the holes in the clouds, how they can, they, they'll come out swiftly, but then they can disappear just as quickly. David, he, he writes a word there in Psalm 139. He says that if I could somehow pluck the wings of the dawn, and if I could travel as far and as swift as light itself travels, he says God would even be there. I would even find the presence of God there. So David has come to this conclusion. If I flee to the, to the most distant, most obscure land or an island in the middle of the ocean, God would already be there. Even if I could travel at the speed of light, David says I could never outrun the presence of God. Now, David would have heard the teachings of pagan deities or pagan worshiping of, of, of pagan deities. And he, he understood that a pagan deity, false gods, false idols, they're, 
their authority was, was limited, even in the understanding of people that worship these false gods, that their, their authority was limited to certain geographical areas of operation. You read all of Psalm 139, and you can almost imagine David leaning back against a tree somewhere and you know, with a piece of grass kind of just gnawing on it, one of them contemplating kind of moments, and find comfort in the idea that the presence and the authority of an almighty God that loves us unconditionally extends all the way to the heavens, extends to the depths of the sea, and extends as far as the east is from the west. And in verse number 10, David finds comfort. He says, I'll never be able to run so far that I could ever outrun the reach of my heavenly Father. That wherever I wind up, God's hand will be there to guide me and to protect me. I, I think about David and that, that place he came to and that confidence that he had in his life. And I, I thought about old Jonah. Jonah came to that same conclusion, but uh, I don't think any of us would want to learn that lesson the way Jonah learned it. Kind of like David, Jonah investigated the heights and the depths of the sea. He understood the east and the west. He understood the land and the sea. And Jonah realized in a, in a, in a life-changing way that he could not find a place where God was not. Wherever Jonah was, he also found God's hand there to guide him, to hold him, to bring him to safety and security. Well, finally, in, in Psalm 139, in verse number 11, David begins to play around with the idea that if, maybe if I'd done stuff in the dark, maybe, maybe I could hide under the cover of dark if I could be out of God's presence and, and the sin or the things I would want to do if I was to do that under darkness. And it's almost like he begins to wonder out loud if there's even a difference in day and night with God. You ever thought about that? Lives in heaven. The Bible describes heaven for us in a place where there is no, uh, there is no sun, because Jesus Christ is the light of that land. So there's no, there's no dark there. So there's, there's no night and day uh, with God. But here, here's what David begins to kind of contemplate. He says in verse number eleven, "If I said, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me." Then he, he goes on to basically say in verse number twelve as he contemplates the idea. Uh, he says, no, he says, surely, so he, if the dark, could the darkness hide me and the light become night around me? There's almost a pause between verse 11 and 12 and you almost hear David says, no. No, he says, he says, even the darkness is not, not, it's not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day. And we might like to think we're hiding things from God privacy of our own home, cover of darkness, if we think that's actually going to help or not, that if we do something in the secret that, that it's somehow hidden from God. But because he is omnipresent, because he is all places at all times, God does see everything. Which means everything that we do, everything that we think, everything that we think can't be seen is done in the full presence of a holy, majestic, and ever-present God. So all of that brings us to this conclusion for this Wednesday. The truth of the omnipresent nature of God shouldn't frighten us. It don't need to intimidate us. It doesn't need to be viewed as big brother watching you you can't outrun. It's not like you should be daring yourself to try to escape the presence of God. It's not meant to be intimidating or frightening. There's a convicting power about it, I suppose, knowing that the sin of our heart, the sin of our mind, those things that we can hide, we think that we're hiding from God, we can't. There's a definite convicting power about it, but it ought to bring us comfort. It's meant to bring us comfort. It tells us that I can anchor my life. The stormy times of my life, I cast my anchor into the presence of God. When the storms of life hit me out of nowhere, when the enemy relentlessly attacks me and my family and my church and my president and every other thing that means a lot to me, 
I become I should be comforted by verses like Isaiah 41:10. Don't fear, for I am with you. Write it down, somebody. You need this verse. Somebody right now needs Isaiah 41:10. Don't fear, for I am with you. Don't anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I'll uphold you with my righteous right hand. My friend, it's because God's always with us that we can't flee the presence of an almighty God, that there's no need to be fearful. There's no need to be worried. There's no need to be dismayed. Rest in that. Don't be intimidated by it. Rest in the fact that wherever you are, whatever you're fearful of, whatever valley you're walking through, that a loving God has promised to be with you, never forsake you, and stick closer than a brother. Amen. Amen. That's a good word, even if I do say so myself. Thank you so much for tuning in today. And I hope it's been an encouragement to you. I invite you tomorrow for another midday moment at high noon as we continue to walk through these glorious uh, anchors of, uh, that we can tie on to in these stormy seas of life. But before then, I invite you to join us tonight at 7 o'clock right there in the sanctuary. You can come in person and be a part of a verse-by-verse of a -verse study that we're doing through the book of Colossians. But if you don't want to get out and you're providentially hindered in some way or choose not to get out, tune in to this same Facebook page and uh, for a live broadcast, a live uh, streaming of our 7 o'clock Bible study from the Sanctuary of New Salem Church. Until we can meet again, either in person or here on the Internet, God bless you. Bye-bye.